Hi, I'm Sun Chung. I'm in the studio with Gordon Chung, no relation. Uh, I think um, a good place to start would be tell me a little bit about your background, uh, where you were born, and how you started with your practice. Well, I was born in London. Yeah, yeah. Um, 75. And we used to live around uh, what my parents would describe the riot spots. <laughs> So we used to move around. Yeah, yeah. And then we moved to Peckham. Uh, it was, and then a brick came flying through the window, hit my mum on the head. Oh, no. And so we moved. And um, so my, my parents ran chip shops for yeah. uh, a while. And then eventually to a restaurant in Croydon. And now they're retired and gone back to Hong Kong. I guess drawing from that as well, I know when I was growing up that my parents weren't so interested in um, my creative side of things yeah. as well, actually. And um, I wondered if there was uh, a fostering of any sort of creative yeah. work from you, or if it was that kind of, you know, that stereotypical notion of study hard and, you know, be, yeah. I don't know, like a lawyer or a doctor or something. Oh, like absolutely. That. Yeah. <laughs> or an accountant. Yeah, exactly. Or, um, yeah, d definitely the doctor, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a lawyer, a businessman. Obviously wanted me to be a high achiever, but I would always come last in my class. Uh, it got to a point, I think, where they, they sort of gave up. <laughs> and, um, and I also gave up because I was trying to please them yeah. with trying to overachieve yeah. and so on. And then suddenly I was like, either second or first. Something had sort of like clicked yeah. in my mind and now I was able to properly answer these things because I didn't have this sort of desire, this overwhelming desire yeah, to actually so it, try yeah, and that's amazing. achieve those grades for someone else. Yeah. So um, were you always interested when you were younger in creative things or, you know, as you say, when you started to achieve, did you start getting more interested in things like sciences? Well, art, or? Well, arts was the only place where I felt it, I had some control yeah. in a way. And it was the world in which I could occupy and enjoyed mm. being in yeah. i loved creating and the you know translation of like these things in your in your head that could be visualized Were you ever attracted to be, I guess, a painter's painter where you would exclusively use oils yeah. in order to, to mimic something like Rembrandt or, you yeah. know, oh, that no, kind absolutely. of thing? No, yeah. when, uh, that's the fun, that, that, <laughs> actually, that's the funny thing, because at the moment, I'm looking at the, the sorts of works yeah. that I wanted to make yeah. when I was a teenager. Yeah. So there's Dutch still lives. Yeah. I really wanted to be able to paint. I must have understood something about yeah. it, but I didn't realise what it was. Yeah. It, the humanity in, in, in Rembrandt's work yeah. is, is extraordinary yeah, yeah. and it stands out. So there's this thing called, yeah, the diachronic perspective, which is the way how I think of my uh, creative uh, process in which I was describing to someone a sort of spiral of creativity throughout the years. And at certain points in this spiral, you would look down and there'll be these parallel sort of like similar points. Uh, in terms of your creative process. So it's just this curious way in which certain themes continue to be there. It's almost like painters, they, they, they get a vocabulary where it, it takes a certain amount of time to absorb lots of different you know, um, aesthetics or, or thoughts about, you know, and just generally looking at paintings. Mm. And then somewhere along the line, I find all of this information kind of coalesces together and then just outputs in the most, you know, amazing way. Your early years, I suppose, is, is mimicking. In a way, you're trying to master a, a language, a technique, a process, a way of thinking. Yeah. And then uh, to turn that into yours as well. So that means sort of digging deep into who you are to infuse that language that you've learned those techniques and processes into what you want to say, into what you want to reflect as well. And yeah, and that all takes a hell of a long time. 
I guess you have a, a trademark style whereby you use stock listings. Yeah, and, and I wanted that. to find something that I felt could reflect what I felt was happening around us. Mm. And so because I was at art school and I wanted to sidestep the discourse of the death of painting within Western painting, I used that language and I, I distorted it or translated it through technology. So what I mean by that is that I would create a collage of, say, circuit boards, for example, or of the stock listings of the Financial Times. And I'll go to the photocopying machine and while it's being scanned, I'll sort of smear it. So that then you would result in um, the, what I thought of as simulated brush strokes from which I would cut shapes from and stick them together to produce these kind of abstract um, paintings. And I would think of these as almost like um, a variant of Chinese cal calligraphy. This idea of um, the ink representing word, image, and poem. And uh, so my photocopy of the brushstroke was a, a variation of that in which the ink was replaced by information and uh, the brush by the photocopying machine. It's back going back to all this idea of multiplicating realities and, and in my work, deconstructive sort of spaces using multi-layered processes, techniques, and, um, and collaging uh, as a way to create uh, these different dimensions. Mm -hmm.